So good evening and welcome to this online event at the Wiener Holocaust Library. Really delighted to see so many of you here tonight for what promises to be a really fascinating discussion. Um, so I'm Barbara Warren at the Senior Curator and Head of Education at the Wiener Holocaust Library and I'll be chairing tonight's event. Um, tonight's event is the fourth event in our um, event series, Racism, Antisemitism, Colonialism and Genocide. And the three previous events are available on the Wiener Library's um, YouTube channel. So you can find them there if you would like to watch those. Um, so just before I introduce the event tonight and our speakers, just a couple of quick words of housekeeping. Um, Everybody in the audience is, is muted and, and um, can't turn off their mute. Um, if you would like to ask questions, then um, could you save them for um, the end? And then we'll have time at the end to take some of the questions from the audience. Um, uh, we, we are closed captioning this, this event. So there is a button to, at the bottom of your screen that will allow you to look at captions as the event goes on. So that's the other thing to say. So tonight's event, um, looking at um, kind of different features and manifestations of British colonial violence, um, really has come about as a result of the publication of two important new works, which look at different aspects of British imperialism. So our speakers tonight are Dr. Michelle Gordon, who is a researcher at the Hugo Valentine Center, Uppsala University. She currently heads a research project on the civilized nature of 19th century warfare, which with a question mark, um, British and German practices of violence in colonial and intra-European wars. And this is funded by the Swedish Research Council. She holds a PhD in history from Royal Holloway, University of London, and she has um, research and teaching expertise in studies of genocide and mass violence with a focus on the British Empire. Dr. Michael Taylor is a historian of colonial slavery, the British Empire and the British Isles. He graduated with a double first in history from the University of Cambridge, where he earned his PhD and also won University Challenge. He has since been a lecturer in modern British history at Balliol College, Oxford, and a visiting fellow at the British Library's Eccles Centre for American Studies. So as I say, in this event, we'll focus on some of the issues raised in these two important new publications by our speakers. So these are um, Dr. Gordon's Extreme Violence and the British Way, Colonial Warfare in Parak, Sierra Leone and Sudan, and Dr. Taylor's The Interest, How the British Establishment Resisted the Abolition of Slavery. Both of these books highlight aspects of British imperialism that have been overlooked, downplayed or forgotten. And tonight we'll explore some of the themes in these works. So Dr. Taylor's book looks at the powerful campaign against the abolition of slavery in Britain, um, and therefore the support that there was for the continuation of a system of violent exploitation prior to 1834. And Dr. Gordon's work explores the nature and significance of the extreme violence seen in the prosecution of small colonial wars in the British Empire in the latter part of the 19th century. In this event, therefore, we're hoping to bring some of this forgotten history um, to light. We're also hoping um, tonight to give some consideration to issues around British historical mem memory in relation to the British Empire and the connections between European imperialism and later events. So I'm um, going to now um, turn to our, our speakers tonight. Um, so question first um, to do with clarifying certain terms in both of, of your work. So, so Michael, in, in your book and in your title, you talk about the interest. So could you just tell us um, who the interest were and what impact they had? Of course. Um, first, I think it would be helpful to say that 200 years ago, politics uh, at Westminster was a very, very different uh, kind of beast. There were not formal political parties in the way that we imagine them now. Um, instead, uh, well, there were groups of Tories and there were groups of Whigs, uh, and broadly speaking, the Tories were 
more conservative, more likely to be Anglican, more likely to be members of the landed gentry. Uh, the Whigs, on the other hand, were more likely to be sympathetic to uh, dissenting Protestantism, uh, to the finance and the trade. Um, what really sort of sharpened the contours of politics were, on the one hand, connections, uh, which were groups of politicians who followed individual political leaders, and on the other hand, interests. Uh, and an interest was, I guess we call it, uh, the 19th century equivalent of a political lobby um, or, or a network. And this could unite lots of people from, from different ends of the political spectrum. So uh, you could have journalists and publishers and intellectuals and MPs and peers all united by an anxiety over, it could have been the corn laws, that was the agricultural interest, or it could have been trade in sugar, trade in slaves, the prosperity of the West Indies, and that was the West India interest of the title. Uh, and I, the interest itself uh, is kind of a shorthand for uh, a whole bunch of different little communities and societies dotted about not only the British Isles, but the British Caribbean. The hub of the interest uh, was the London Society of the West India Planters and Merchants. Um, it was based in St. James off Piccadilly, and it was led by uh, Charles Rosellis, who was one of the great friends of George Canning, who's probably the most important politician of the day. Uh, and within the interest, uh, there were hundreds of MPs, there were peers, journalists, um, influential men uh, who could really dictate the tone and the pace of what happened in Parliament, what happened in the political journals, uh, and what the kind of economic and imperial policy Britain would set. Um, this was one of the most formidable political units uh, in British history uh, from the end of the late 18th century uh, through to the, uh, the first few decades in the 19th century, this was one of the political units which everybody had to reckon with. Yes, and um, I think it's worth saying that it's in, in some senses, you could say, at least in the sense of um, su supporting um, the continuation of slavery, you could you could include, say, the um, King William IV as, as a member of the interest in, in a sense, some writers, I think Elizabeth Barrett Browning, um, um, Gladstone in terms of politicians. So it, it a lot of big names in, in British um, history, um, really. And th this this group, what, what impact, even though in the end slavery did um, was abolished, um, what impact did they have though um, in, you know, you said it's this very powerful lobby. Um, what was their effect? Because in a sense, in a way they lost in the end, but um, they did have an impact. Well, 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 did they? They, well, that, yes. you know, that, that, that is quite a good question. So the, they managed to negotiate a settlement where they consented to the abolition of slavery, um, but they received compensation, and this is they, not the slaves, uh, received compensation to the tune of twenty million pounds. And in eighteen thirty-three, that was about forty percent of the British government's expenditure for that year. Um, this was a remarkable extortion, I would say, of the of the British state and the British people. Uh, and indeed, we we as British taxpayers didn't finish paying it off because of the particular kind of loans that were taken to finance that compensation until 2015. And that, I'd say, is one of the many ways in which they could influence uh, sort of the public debate and discourse about slavery. But there are lots of incidents um, dotted through the narrative of my book where um, perhaps before when I was purely analysing you know, the arguments that they were making, I couldn't quite piece together how, influ how high influential they might have been. Uh, but you see from the correspondence of the abolitionists and from the interest itself and from the major politicians that you know, there would be um, suspiciously hastily arranged conferences with ministers. And then the next day it would be announced in the paper that a proposal to move on the abolition of slavery had been delayed or deferred. Mm. Um, so as much as they were filling all of the most prominent newspapers and periodicals with pro-slavery literature. And these periodicals are really the, the engine of discourse and opinion in Britain at the time. Um, they're also working behind the scenes, glad handing, paying backhanders. Uh, it, it's tempting to think of them as some kind of you know, tentacular network. Um, and that's maybe going a bit too far into caricature. Um, but it was they and not the abolitionists who held the political upper hand for most of this decade. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and how in, in this account, your account of, of the abolition of slavery and the resistance to the abolition of, of slavery, how does your account um, differ from the way in which these events have generally been recalled in Britain? There has been 
an awful lot of incredibly important and pioneering scholarship on slaveholders and slaveholding. Um, I think I saw the name of Keith McClellan there along the top a little a little bit earlier, and he was part of a team at uh, UCL, uh, part of the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, which has created this enormous public database with a wealth of information about who was a slaveholder in Britain. Um, so historians like uh, Richard Hussey and David Beck Ryden and Christopher Padley have all done their own really important work um, on slaveholding um, and debates about slavery. I think what my book does is perhaps give an agency uh, and really to, 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 the, to the slaveholders. It, it, it's been tempting, I think, in British historiography uh, and maybe in British public memory just to regard slaveholders as a bunch of people who were and then suddenly they were not. Um, but really, these were people who fought tooth and nail to maintain what they regarded as their legal property in man. Uh, and by telling the narrative, the how and why we got from being a major slaveholding power uh, to a self-proclaimed self abolitionist nation is the story that I wanted to tell. And I think far um, some, some quite old books from the 20s and 30s, uh, this is the most detailed account of the decade between the formation of the Anti-Slavery Society and the passage of the Slavery Abolition Act. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So turning now um, to Michelle, um, in the context of, of your work, um, you refer to the British way. So I, I just um, wondered if you could explain what you mean in this context, in the context of British colonial wars by the British way. Yeah, sorry, Barbara, I muted myself and then couldn't unmute myself. Um, yeah, so thanks, first of all, to you and to the Vienna Holocaust Library for having me uh, be allowed to be part of this series event. Um, so yeah, so first of all, then this idea of a British way, it comes from initially from a book written by Basil Liddlehart, uh, The British Way in Warfare, from 1932. Um, that book focuses predominantly on his experiences in the First World War and of more traditional European warfare, doesn't really discuss this idea of irregular uh, warfare and small wars. Um, but it's important because it speaks to this kind of idea and notion of nations having a particular military character. Um, and this has been used more recently by scholars um, to look at different parts of kind of British military history and this idea of a British way. So, um, for example, this, the idea that's a very strong uh, notion in the literature that there's been a British way of counterinsurgency, for example, particularly in Britain's involvement in Palestine, Malaya and Kenya going through the 1940s to 1960s. And as part of this has been a long held assumption that the British Empire is somehow less violent than its contemporary European counterparts. Uh, this is spoken to in literature on minimum force, this idea of a hearts and minds approach, civil military cooperation, and ideas of British restraint. Um, however, more recently then we see revisionist histories of these kinds of counterinsurgency operations and decolonization that have completely contradicted this view of this very specific moderate idea of a British way. Um, but the, the small wars that I'm looking at obviously precede this period and I look at 19th century colonial warfare or so-called small wars. And the focus of my book then is to look at the extent to which we can speak of a British way in terms of these wars and with regards to the specific methods and tactics used. Um, these, these wars have been largely overlooked in the literature outside of more kind of military history um, frameworks or amateur historian approaches and are often kind of part of this whole kind of um, like colonial skirmishes, colonial daring do and the pluck and this, this, these kind of ideas. So it espouses notions of uh, Victorian values, this idea that the British are uh, subject to kind of fair play, chivalry and restraint. So these kind of um, arguments that uh, there's a British way that's rooted in British military psyche that's, that's moderate. And, and also this idea of minimum force, but that of course doesn't apply to a 19th century uh, context, but still there are assumptions that, that, that these wars are based on this, on this moderation and these assumptions continue to today. So that's broadly what I'm looking at. So yeah, can we say that there's a British way in colonial warfare? 
Yes. And, and what is that way, I suppose, it perhaps has been, in your view, uh, misrepresented in, in some of the other scholarship. And so your, your book looks at um, three case studies of British imperial warfare in Perak and Malaya, Sierra Leone and in Sudan. And so I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about what kinds of conflicts um, these were. Um, how did British colonial forces and military leaders prosecute these wars? What tactics did they use? And just give us a bit more of a, a sort of sense of what kind of conflict um, you're looking at and, and what your findings were about the British way of um, colonial con conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. So yeah, as you mentioned then, I mean, the cases, just to say briefly, and obviously it's a very complex matter, the British Empire in each case is individually complex, and I appreciate most people won't obviously have read the book, so I'll do my best to do this in a kind of broad sense without the examples being too specific. But the, so the conflicts I'm looking at then are the Perak War in Malaya, which was 1875 to six, the so-called Hut Tax War in Sierra Leone in 1898, and the Anglo-Egyptian War of Recon Reconquest in Sudan in 1896 to nine. So, um, so the thinking behind this then is to take these three cases that were at different stages of colonialism. They occurred in very different contexts related to British aims and the uh, formality or lack thereof of colonization in these regions. So each presents different kind of solutions for the achieving British aims, but all also, also ultimately resort to the, a variety of methods of extreme violence to achieve their objectives. And all of these walls have the commonality that they would fall under this remit of small walls, as I've mentioned, which just to clarify is um, based on a term coined by Charles Corwell. And it's about this idea of kind of irregular warfare. So it's a focus on kind of conquest, annexation, suppression of insurrections, concepts of lawlessness, um, trying to conquer territory or to avenge some kind of um, yeah, perceived wrongdoing. Um, so these wars then, and this kind of encapsulates all of the examples that I'm using in the book then, uh, these wars are um, typically characterized as having an imbalance of resources uh, between the, those to be colonized and the colonizers. Um, of course, that includes kind of uh, European technology and weaponry. But also the, there's a kind of rebalance to this in the sense that indigenous forces have the upper hand with regards to knowledge of local terrain and obviously acclimatized uh, to the local areas, for example. Um, and um, they're also very much, um, I mean, the population are brought into these wars very quickly in the sense that obviously any kind of uh, indigenous forces are reliant on the local land, they're reliant on the local population. And this creates a situation very quickly in which the, the locals are deemed to be kind of hostile populations, which mm. obviously invariably then leads to, uh, well, obviously not ine inevitably, but they do lead in these cases to the destruction of homes and crops, for example. And this uh, kind of idea of a moral effect of this kind of violence against the, the region as a whole. Um, so the, the, these kinds of conflicts, they did often entail, um, you know, atrocities against civilian populations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it includes, um, so the kind of methods are uh, looting, um, scorched earth tactics, destruction of crops, um, summary execution, even sometimes kind of punitive expeditions, very focused in on kind of collective retribution and um, viewing the area as a whole, regardless of the extent to the kind of perceive, perceived level of um, opposition against the, the, the colonists. Um, and, and the casualties tended to be much higher or were much higher on, on um, the, yeah. the, the side of, uh, you know, whoever the, the British colonial forces were fighting. I think in Sudan, they were very um, imbalanced, weren't they? The casualties yeah, on each side. Indeed, so, uh, on the, so in the final battle of the reconquest, the Battle of Omdurman, uh, um, around 11,000 um, of the Madis troops, so the, the Sudanese troops, um, were killed and 16,000 wounded. And the contrast on the Anglo-Egyptian side is 48 men killed and 382 wounded. So a vast contrast, and this is often described as a one-sided massacre, even though it's a bit more complex than that. 
And actually the numbers hide as well, the, the very prevalent tactic amongst the Anglo-Egyptian troops in this case to uh, neglect the dying um, and the wounded on the battlefield. They were left for days just to die in some cases, or they were put out of their misery in some cases, surrendering troops were often killed. So all of these, obviously within the wounded, then we have the people that were later later died. But in contrast, then in the Perak war, at most the British were fighting 300 indigenous fighters. So that really shows kind of the range mm. um, of the kinds of uh, opposition that they faced. And, and this is something that's so important about the book then is to show that despite this, um, the difference in levels of, of how much opposition was being faced, that they still ultimately went to this kind of catalogue of, of extreme violence. And these methods were at their disposal then when they felt that they were necessary, regardless of the size of, I mean, because the small war doesn't obviously denote the size of the war, just this type of war. So we could see such a discrepancy in the levels, but regardless, even something as small as Perak, which really was just a handful of people, um, yeah, we still see that the blockading of the local area, the starvation of the local population, all of these kinds of tactics, which I've alluded to. Thank you. So just turning to um, Michael, I think we can see, um, you know, Michelle's book points to um, the role of, of extreme violence in extending and maintaining the British Empire. But I think it would be it would be useful um, for the audience to get an, an understanding of the situation for slaves um, in the, say the West Indies after the abolition of the slave trade in the British Empire in 1807. So the slave trade had been abolished, but slavery um, remained. So could you tell us a bit about the conditions experienced by slaves in the West Indies at the time, Michael? Of course, um, and, that, and that's a very good point to make uh, for the purposes of context, that whenever the slave trade was abolished in 1807, or New Year's Day 1808, uh, and this is the campaign with which Wilberforce is really involved. He doesn't play much of a role in the campaign against slavery. Um, that did absolutely nothing to change either the status of slavery or the condition of the enslaved people in the Caribbean. There were still more than 700,000 people enslaved in the Caribbean, uh, more than 300,000 in Jamaica, which was more people uh, than there were people of any description in any British city except London. Um, the abolitionists hadn't, hadn't attacked slavery itself. There were some political reasons for this, but there was also an assumption that if they could eradicate the slave trade, if they could prevent plantation owners from importing uh, new people from Africa repeatedly, then the plantation owners would be forced to improve the conditions uh, gradually and gradually and gradually, and finally slavery would just uh, dissipate into uh, what they described as a hoped would be um, in quite a pejorative way, uh, a contented peasantry. Um, in terms of what conditions were actually like, um, it won't surprise you to know that because this was such an emotive subject, there are very few completely objective sources. Uh, in fact, there was a raging war of representation, is uh, how it's been described, over the nature of slavery. Uh, so on the one hand, you have pro-slavery West Indian sources describing effectively a tropical paradise. Um, and you know, they, you know, they make comparisons of the weather, Britain to the Caribbean, who wouldn't want to be uh, in the sunshine and the heat. And they go through all of uh, what the master supposedly provided to their slaves. Um, you know, they describe neat cottages in the shade of palm trees, uh, the, the masters uh, giving uh, the enslaved people muslins and silks to wear, and they were never short, they were never naked, they were never cold. Um, they also suggested that uh, the, you know, the land was so profitable that the enslaved people could uh, procure rich meats and spices and uh, tropical vegetables for themselves. The work was very moderate, and they also argued that economic self-interest prevented any excessive cruelty towards uh, the enslaved people, because the logic being, why would I harm my own property? Of course, that was all nonsense. Um, it was part of a very decided propaganda campaign uh, to to attempt to persuade the British public and British politicians that there was no humanitarian grounds for intervening in the Caribbean. Uh, the reality, very, very different. Um, and while unfortunately there are not m that many um, black voices from the Caribbean who can attest to firsthand experience of these conditions, a lot of it gets filtered through colonial courts and abolitionist sources. Um, the autobiography of Mary Prince, which was published uh, 
1831 in Britain is probably the best and the most vivid source about the reality uh, of being enslaved uh, on the ground in the Caribbean. And she describes in fairly brutal detail um, the horrors of working in uh, salt works in, you know, in Bermuda um, or in, in, in the Turk Islands, uh, where you know, the salt was eating through the skin of people where um, mm. slaves who are regarded as being miscreant or unruly are flogged uh, and punished horrendously. Um, there are also from, you know, perhaps unexpected sources, from white colonial sources, tales of you know, astonishing atrocity um, from that Thomas Thistlewood is maybe one of the most notorious figures in British colonial history. He was a son of a Lincolnshire farmer. He went out to Jamaica, uh, made his way, eventually owned uh, some land, but was most notorious as an overseer on one of the plantations. Uh, and the tales of cruelty that he inflicts upon uh, not only the men, but the women on his plantation. Uh, he details every sexual assault that he commits in schoolboy Latin. It's one of the most perverse things you could ever have the misfortune to read. Uh, and the, the, just the, the, the atrocious violence that he inflicts upon slaves who he regards as being undisciplined. Uh, I, I've never described them out loud before. I'm not sure I want to, but they are, I, I have tried to recapture them and, and, and describe them accurately in the book. Um, this was a world of violence and mistreatment. Uh, and I think it says something either about the ulterior motives or the gullibility of members of the British press that so much of the uh, the West Indian version of events got regurgitated throughout Britain in the 1820s and 30s. Yes, and I suppose it just sort of um, extending that question of this this um, war of represent re representations, um, perhaps you, you could comment on British depictions of slave uprisings um, compared to British depictions of their own responses um, yeah. to these uprisings or, or, or indeed to you know, even sometimes quite trivial examples of challenges to British authority in the colonies, these two different um, representations um, of events, perhaps you could comment on those. Yeah, of course. It, it, it's important to say that everything that happens in the British colonies in the 1810s, 20s, 30s, happens in the shadow of the Haitian Revolution. Um, and the Haitian Revolution becomes another one of these events which is represented completely differently by the opposing parties to this. Um, so on the anti-slavery side, they see a successful independent nation uh, making its way uh, on the pro-slavery West Indian side. Uh, you have almost grand guignol tales of uh, horrendous violence and revenge perpetrated uh, on the former French planters. Um, and this instills the fear, and I think that the, the fear was really genuine in British colonialists, um, that enslaved uprisings would be the end of the colony, there would be massacres. Um, and so whenever re rebellion breaks out in Demerara in 1823, there is panic, uh, there is hysteria. Um, the army is roused and eventually nothing really happens because the Demeraran rebels were really just trying to assert rights to their holidays and um, have freedom to worship whenever they wanted. Um, but on the flip side, how this is reported uh, in Britain is oh this was close we you know we really we dodged a bullet there this could have been the, the absolute destruction of our colony um <laughs> arguably the worst violence of the entire rebellion is then perpetrated by the british authorities who respond to it um by you know, brutally murdering kwamina who was kwamina gladstone who's one of the uh, the ringleaders of the rebellion uh, and then shooting about 90 uh, of the alleged rebels and often shooting them follow, following kangaroo courts where um, the evidence was produced and nothing was, was translated for on, for on the behalf of um, any of the alleged rebels. Um, and this happens again in Jamaica in 1831-32. So after Demerara, there is this idea that any kind of black freedom because of Haiti, because of the way that Demerara was reported, will lead to wanton violence. Uh, and that it is essential to maintain slavery in order to preserve the safety of the colonists, of the white colonists. What Jamaican Rebellion in 1831-32 does is actually persuade the Whigs who are now in office, the slightly more liberal sympathetic Whigs, that actually it's slavery causing the violence itself. And that the only way to prevent the complete immolation of the British colonies is the grant emancipation. Um, even at that, the different representations in you know, missionaries' accounts and soldiers' accounts versus um, the abolitionists' accounts of 
of what happens in Jamaica. Again, there's a complete bifurcation. It's often quite hard whenever I'm trying to piece them all together to think that they're describing the same event. Mm. Yes, that's interesting. And I think it's worth saying with um, Demerara that that was a British colony, um, a slave colony that Britain took possession of after the abolition of the slave trade, just to show how, you know, the extent to which this the, the abolition of the trade did not mean the British Empire turning against slavery. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. And, and, and Trinidad, too. Yes, um, yes. And yeah, so so um, I think, you know, the, what you, you've discussed in terms of how, um, you know, the violence um, or that might be contained or not really in, in, in some aspects of, of rebellion or challenge to British authority were depicted compared to then the violence of the response. It kind of leads to thinking about the question of um, perhaps um, the British thinking that they're civilized almost no matter what happens and um, portraying um, in this instance, perhaps slave or slave, um, slaves involved in, in rebel rebellions as, as, as savage, really. And I think that l leads us back to, to Michelle. And um, Michelle, um, perhaps you um, could comment in the context of the countries that you examine um, on how outrages, so-called outrages, committed by colonial subjects were depicted in Britain in contrast to the depiction of um, the extreme violence perpetrated by imperial forces um, that followed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, also in terms of this framing of civilization, like you say, I mean, there's this uh, kind of tension going on or relationship going on, with this idea of kind of bringing civilization over and then when there's some kind of reaction back on the part of the indigenous populations that kind of reaffirms the idea of the need for the civilizing mission and this concept of moral duty that see this is exactly why we need to go in there because you know they don't understand that we're trying to help them they don't understand what the benefits of us being here are and of course then it also is used then to yeah, justify the extreme violence that they perpetrate, which is, is necessary because look at the nature of the natives, this is what they do. Um, and of course, then it's seen as, as being legitimate violence as opposed to this idea of an illegitimate um, opposition of, of those that they perceive themselves to be trying to help, or at least obviously that's the representation. Uh, there are of course also other kind of depictions of this, there are kind of criticisms of the way that the British Empire is being, um, um, how the colonization process and how it's being done. Obviously they, these critiques don't question the, the right of the British to colonize, but there are obviously some criticisms of the way the, the, the and kind of the, the argument that the British have somehow brought these, uh, these outrages back upon themselves because obviously there's a, um, a relationship between the two and the, the in anti-colonial opposition is, is obviously because of British infringement in the first place. But of course, this, this, this idea of the savage native is, is constantly used as a justification for not only why the British need to go in there and be civilized, but also then justifying when they are not civilized. Um, because then they use this argument that you can only uh, fight savages with savage tactics. So again, it becomes this kind of circle of, of, of justification. Um, were there people who kind of questioned that, uh, you know, because it, it is um, sort of in order to maintain their sense of superiority or their sense that they were civilized, you know, yes, as you say, they had to kind of um, justify what they were doing, but were, were there people around um, who questioned, you know, um, who questioned that in its kind of way of looking at it? Um, yeah, I mean, so there were MPs in Parliament who questioned the way that the empire was being conducted, the Aborigines Protection Society, for example. But there the, the really was a consensus that, as I said, that the British had a right to, to the empire. They had a right to colonise. It was just about how they went about doing that. And um, yeah, so there were kind of outcries when, for example, after like some kind of conflict, then the, the 
alleged perpetrators would be hanged without due process, for example, kind of, you know, that we need, again, this idea of we need to do this, but we need to do it in a British way, which is fair. And, you know, these are subjects and they have these rights. And um, so it's, it's the means of doing it rather than the actual project itself. Mm, yes. And I, I just wonder if you could um, kind of expand on, on that and in that sense of, of um, of what was happening in Britain and what was happening in the colonies. Um, and so how would you characterize the relationship between the center of the empire in London and you know, colonial administrators or military commanders um, in, in colonial countries during the conflicts that you examine? Yeah, so I mean, it already starts kind of before the conflicts because this, is, this speaks to the, one of the reasons that we see these conflicts happening. I would say, um, I mean, obviously that there were times where the colonial office had completely different objectives to the men on the ground. So these men on the spot really um, had a lot of autonomy and the colonial office were really kind of uh, at the mercy of the objectives of these men, the information that they gave, they were able to utilize kind of the technology of the time and how long it would take for information to filter back. Um, but at the same time, the, the colonial office basically wanted colonialism, obviously, on the cheap. I mean, they wanted, they didn't want the politi political expansion, but they wanted the, the benefits. And obviously, that in itself um, created a tension on the ground that often led to some kind of opposition. So whilst the colonial office may have been seen kind of as a more moderate force in some senses, it was still in that way, in an underlying way, then encouraging um, conflict on this, on this level. Um, and so in terms of when the conflict breaks out, then there's always this delay. For example, in the case of Parak, the governor goes back to Lord Carnarvon, um, the uh, secretary of state for the colonies asking for troops, but he gets the request for troops before he knows about the outbreak. So it's just chaos. But of mm. course, at the end of the day, he says, well, I have to send the troops because it's my responsibility, even though I don't know what's happening. So again, you see the whole situation is at the mercy of the men on the ground who invariably want to increase territorial expansion. They're in obviously kind of political might. So um, yes, uh, so there's, there's that. And then from the perspective of the kind of violence that's being perpetrated. Um, it certainly isn't the case that, that, that in London, the politicians were always advocating for uh, more moderate approaches, that, that's, that's not the case. And, um, and also, the, it, as I said, that the, the aim was clear, it was about the British Empire. So when it came to it, whatever kind of opposition was voiced from the indigenous people, um, I mean, their needs and their treatment became secondary once any kind of violence broke out, because obviously this needed to be dealt with and as swiftly as possible, because of course the colonial office was, um, was um, looking at the whole empire and all of these kind of acts of resistance breaking out and this kind of obvious panic setting in of, 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 of all of this opposition. Um, so yes. Yeah, thank you. And, and Michael, um, also thinking about um, the relationship between kind of centre of, of, of empire and what's sometimes called periphery, as in the colonies, how would you characterise in the period you're looking at the relationship between West Indian colonies and the centre of um, empire? Well, I, I think that um, slave colonies were, you know, they, they've been quarantined in the British memory distance of a couple of hundred years, but also several thousand miles. And I think the distance between uh, metropole and colony is essential to understanding communication and the ideas in the period. And the rule of thumb that I've used is any missive from the colonial office or from the colonies back to London or Liverpool or wherever should take about six weeks to arrive. And this can occasionally cause quite a bit of confusion uh, and people are writing and acting not in full possession of the facts. Um, but there was also this colonialist sense of inferiority, I would say. Um, the, you know, the, it's a bit of a trope, but it's no less true that um, white society in the colonies would ape the motherland as much as humanly possible. And then whenever somebody had finally made their fortune, uh, they would disappear uh, back to Britain. 
uh, and they would become absentee planters. Uh, or maybe the merchants would never have set foot in the colonies themselves. Uh, John Gladson, who was the biggest uh, sort of owner of enslaved people in Demerara, uh, never visited the colonies. The Gladson family fortune uh, was built in the back of the transatlantic mm -hmm. trade, but none of them, so far as I know, had ever been to the West Indies. Um, so there is really, a, you know, there, there is a disconnect and there is a, there's a lack of, there is imperfect information uh, in the metropole. Um, you know, it, it's why in Bleak House, I know this is a couple of decades later, but Dickens talks about telescopic philanthropy. Uh, and although they didn't use that precise phrase, that's something that the pro-slavery lobby uh, charged the abolitionists with. They're just looking through their telescopes uh, and not really seeing what was going on because they argued that only they, because they had been in the colonies, could possibly tell the British people what was really happening. Uh, and this is represented really well in a in a massive cartoon by Cruikshank uh, called John Bull taking a clear view of the question. Um, I, so, yeah, it's absolutely essential, I think, you know, not just the mm. distance physically, but the distance psychologically between the two places. Yes, yes. No, it's, so it is something that's quite striking, the kind of the planters who never even went to the West, West Indies, you know, to their to their own plantations and those that, uh, you know, were very much um, present there. Um, so I just want to turn to um, a somewhat um, different question, though it's all obviously very related. So Michael, I wonder, I just want to turn to the kind of question of the significance of, of racism and racist ideas in underpinning all of this. So what would you say was the role of, of racism and racist ideas in promoting, justifying and sustaining um, slavery? I mean, how central were racist, racist ideas to the interests defense of slavery? Yeah, there are, um in my opinion, probably three pillars of pro-slavery thought. One was religious and biblical, one was economic, uh, and the second was uh, racial or civilizational was really the, the language in which it was couched at the time. Um, the, the slaveholders were not polygynist. They did not believe that all the different races of men were separate species who, who had you know, come from separate creations. They were monogynous because that was you know, the intellectual authority at the time, James Cost Pritchard was a monogynist. Uh, and they simply believed that everybody was civilizing at different rates. And really important to this was the Scottish Enlightenment idea of stadial theory. And it held that uh, every society passed through four different stages of civilization. Uh, one, uh, the very bottom was hunter, you know, hunting and gathering. The second uh, was pastoral farming. Then there was arable farming. And then there was uh, commercial city dwelling where people would trade rather than make things. Um, and Believing this gave uh, the West India interest what they thought was an absolutely you know, a winning argument for the, in the defense of slavery, um, in that they thought that by enslaving African people, whom they regarded as inhabiting the lowest rung of civilization, by teaching them arable agricultural methods, uh, and simply by dint of being civilized Europeans at the highest stage of civilization, that enslavement was a process of civilization and that to abolish slavery would be to not only interrupt that progress but actually risk uh, the regression of the civilizational pro of progress uh, and this is why they pointed to places like Haiti and Sierra Leone where there were um, free colonies of formerly enslaved people um, and this is why the anti-slavery lobby and the pro-slavery lobby use both of those places uh, to represent their own ideas about what a free black society would look like and how it might work. And I think you can probably guess which side came down, which side of that argument. Yes, thank you. And I think, you know, um, by the by the time of, of the events that Michelle's talking about, in, 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 an, in an awful way, racist ideas had developed um, and um, become sort of pseudoscientific. So, Michelle, I, I wonder if you could comment on what role racism played in enabling and justifying the brutal suppression of opposition to British rule and of civilian populations in, in the British Empire? Yes, yeah, I've already spoken to, there was a very clear kind of um, perception of the nature of the natives and this kind of savage opposition that they expected, which they could then almost kind of even before it breaks out, then brutally suppress. And the, this kind of idea of uh, brutally suppressing this potential, it's all based on this racist idea of 
of uh, these brutes that need telling, um, that they are childlike, can't rule themselves, uh, for example. And um, a clear way in which we see this is the idea of the uncivilized, uh, that are therefore deemed to be outside the remit of so-called civilized warfare. So these inferior indigenous enemies aren't subject to any of the same standards of warfare that Europeans could expect. And we see this in a variety of ways, including the use of expanding bullets, for example, the dum-dum bullets, and also that they actually, the British in particular, actually developed uh, weaponry purely for um, indigenous foes on the basis that a normal bullet wouldn't be enough to stop these kind of almost animalistic brutes, for example. So we see it in that sense. And we also see it, for example, in the first-hand accounts from the soldiers involved. This is you see a very much kind of informed racial idea of their foes and their justifications in the kind of the dehumanization. They speak very openly, some of them about this idea of, you know, it's just like fox hunting. These, these aren't really people or, you know, like, I mean, really kind of vile descriptions of uh, certain characteristics of the bodies when they're dead, for example, and the smells and this real kind of sense of disgust that we see that really, and then after the battle is over, this disgust continues, particularly in the case of Omdurman, they, they arrive there and they're just horrified by how disgusting it is and how thin everybody is. And it kind of then reinforces this, these pre prejudices that they already have. So, I mean, the, 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 the racism that underpins this is ab absolutely essential to, to understanding the violence that, that takes place, as well as, of course, this idea of kind of racial hierarchies, martial races. We have Garnet Wosley, who's a key uh, kind of player in British Empire, writing a, an article on the Negro soldier and comparing different African soldiers to different breeds of dogs, for example. This is all really kind of, mm. yeah, mainstream things that we're talking about. Yes, thank you. Um, I just um, sort of, finally want want to, us to kind of consider I suppose some of the legacies of, of this so Michael your your book starts um, by looking at um, perhaps a, a rather politicized narrative that there sometimes is about um, in in modern Britain about um, the um, supposedly the, the fantastic story of, of the abolition of, of slavery um, and in a sense you almost talk about aspects of, of denial about the real story that remains. So I just wonder if you could um, comment on why you think that the, the aspects um, that we've looked at tonight of the story of British imperialism has, have been forgotten or downplayed. Well, you know, I, 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 the first reason I think, and there are many, and this is probably worth a book in its own right, um, is that the most immediate histories of abolition are written by the abolitionists themselves, and they're mm -hmm. essentially hagiographies of their own lives while they're so living. I mean, Thomas Clarkson in particular, George Stephen, they both write histories of abolitionism where they are front and center and they are the heroes of their own myths. Um, this then, on the other side of it, slaveholders and members of the West India interest do a phenomenal job of, and I use this word advisedly, whitewashing their own histories. Mm. Um, having fought vigorously and viciously to maintain slavery, um, they then turn uh, on the head of the pin and say, well, obviously we were in favour of abolition all along and we get to celebrate this like everybody else. I mean, Robert Peel was one of the most pro-slavery politicians of the decade I look at, uh, but within years he's giving speeches in Tamworth uh, about how abolition is one of the greatest triumphs of British history and it, sh it, you know, it will be an unparalleled act of kindness and compassion. Um, when, you know, when the history of the world is written. Um, so I, I think from that point, it just becomes easier for people, for, for British consumers of history, consumers of popular history, um, to celebrate that narrative. You know, it, it, it's just easier for the national mythology to celebrate abolition without really paying attention to the fact that if abolition was a great achievement, then the process of enslavement must have been in itself uh, a great evil. But, we do, that aspect of the story isn't really told or hasn't really been told. Um, and to be honest, I, I, it's just a, it's quite difficult. You know, this is not a nice story um, with a, ha a happy Hollywood ending. 
Um, there's the abolition of the slave trade, but as you know, my book is all about, this doesn't change the nature of slavery itself. Then we have the abolition of slavery, but that isn't really the abolition of slavery um, because there's a system of apprenticeship that's imposed on the people in the West Indies, which is slavery effectively uh, in all but name. And even then, it's not as if the people who were enslaved and who were then made apprentices uh, get to say, you know, they are not uh, given every right of a, of a white freeborn Britain. They're subjected to the same violence and rapacity and exploitation that every other victim of the British Empire suffers. Um, and that isn't an easy narrative um, to tell. You know, it stops and it starts and there's no resolution. Yes. Thank you. And then turning um, to Michelle, sort of thinking in, about, to some extent, kind of um, other aspects of, of legacy and memory, perhaps. Um, what connection, Michelle, do you think that there is between the violence of European imperialism in the 19th century and European 20th century atrocities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the premise of the book really came about to think about um, what uh, 19th century European imperialism can tell us about the genocide of violence of the 20th century. And in my view, it can tell us a lot. It's, I mean, we can see uh, this dynamic of violence. Uh, we can argue that the British Empire was part of a, a system of violence based on a racial hierarchy and um, and it was the, the scale and significance of the empire and the, of the violence. I mean, it very much, at the very least, provides this context for what, what was to come and, ex, and a, this kind of accepted precedence of, of ways of dealing with unwanted populations, for example. Um, I also think more specifically with the British empire that um, Obviously, in terms of the Holocaust and other kind of Nazi population policies, Hitler himself kind of espoused this admiration for the British Empire, while at the same time saying, well, German, German colonialism got it wrong, but we aspire to the way that the British have done it, which I'm not saying is any kind of a blueprint. Clearly it isn't, but it doesn't change the fact that there were key Nazis that thought that um, the British Empire and this kind of racial hierarchy was a way in as a way of working together with the British, that the British would understand this, this, this kind of approach. Um, obviously we had Hannah Arendt talking about this boomerang thesis and this idea of uh, this uh, Nazi genocide or violence being European imperialism come home. And obviously that's led to a lot of very interesting uh, research and this idea of how practices are kind of learnt and reapplied across time. And obviously the concentration camp is a key example and the way in which these things kind of develop over a series um, and across different contexts. Um, I think that, um, yeah, that they absolutely has very much to, to tell us. Um, and they are, of course, also connected in terms of the fact that the, the empire, at least in the British case, continued after this violence that we're talking about. And of course, while the British um, argued this kind of idea of fight, having fought the good war in the Second World War. And obviously the Britain, Britain's relationship with the Holocaust is far more complicated than it's often talked about anyway, obviously. Um, but regardless of that, this, this idea of Britain having fought the war to argue never again, when of course over the forties to the sixties, they were uh, undertaking horrific methods of violence um, in the wars of decolonization. So you know, again, these kind of concentration tactics, torture, we see all kinds of the horrors of these dirty wars. Um, so the, the, the histories are interlinked in, in, in many ways. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you very much. I mean, I think, thank you both so much. You've given us a huge um, amount to think about. Um, I think we've just got a little bit of time um, for questions and I think, um, my colleague has just um, also posted some details of how to obtain the books, and I think she's going to post, um, yes, a, uh, details of how to get um, a 35% discount on Michelle's um, book. Um, so um, there we go. The, yes, that's a flyer for that. Um, so I'm just going to open up the chat. If you've posed a question already, I haven't um, been looking at the chat. So if people could put any questions that they have 
in um, the chat now, that would be great. I'll just have a look back and see. Ah, there is, right, I could, there is, there is one. So um, Babette has got a question for Michael. Um, so she asks, what do you consider to be the consequences of enslavement in terms of Caribbean and UK life in the present? Uh, I'll try to keep this very brief, but I think um, if I could summarize it in a sentence or two, aggressive underdevelopment in the Caribbean would be one of the key answers. Uh, the Caribbean Commission has identified uh, 10 non-monetary uh, means of or courses of reparations uh, that could undo a lot of that. Uh, and, and they focus, I think, really wisely on things like um, education and technology transfer um, and medical knowledge, uh, which were areas in which the Caribbean simply could not develop because of its history of enslavement and, and colonization. Um, it, for Britain itself, uh, I, I don't think we've really reckoned with the consequences of enslavement. I think we've celebrated the consequences of abolition without really paying any attention uh, to the initial process of enslavement. But hopefully last year's events uh, and debates like these might uh, help us get towards an answer. Thank you. And then I've got a question from Jenny to Michelle asking, um, she's curious about um, who qualified as violent from the British point of view. If, if the British Empire um, was moderate, then who was um, immoderate? Okay, yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the whole point of these kind of discussions about the, the context of European imperialism and the Holocaust, for example, and obviously the main focus then has been on the German cases, of course, with the Herero genocide as the first genocide of the 20th century, that would be the, and, and of course, the French in Algeria as well, um, which again had its own kind of momentum, particularly with the decolonization, and, and those cases were different, but to um, yeah, obviously to argue that the British in itself were moderate is, is, is clearly not the case, even though that's been the pre prevalent view. But yeah, the focus has been very much on, on the German cases and understandably so, but I think there's obviously merit in looking at other cases and then maybe we can look at proper comparisons then once we've actually, um, instead of assuming these things about these different nations that we actually use archival research to see what, what, what actually was going on. Would the, would the Belgium Empire have been another one that the British would have regarded as somehow worse or, you know, more? Oh, violent? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And there certainly were some horrific um, occurrences there. But so, obviously, um, from the British point of view, everyone was worse. And they were yes. the benevolent empire doing everything better than everybody else, including decolonization. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And and then um, also for um, Michelle, um, Avin's asking, what about um, the role of visual sources in the establishment and maintenance of um, the British um, way? So illustrations and newspapers, paintings, um, photography, and so on. Because I, I suppose, you know, it, it's not, it, it's the precursor to the event you're talking about in Sudan, but there's obviously very famous representations of General Gordon's um, kind of last stand and all that um, as, as one quite famous example. But yes, if you could perhaps comment on the role of those kinds of sources. Yeah, well, I actually have an article on atrocity photography in the British Empire, and it looks at a set of photographs from the uh, Sudan campaign and arguing that these, while fairly, um, I mean, they, they were accessible to an extent at the time, but they don't form part of our kind of visual catalogue of empire now and of course we're well aware of kind of the, the atrocity photography of others um, but we aren't aware of, of these kind of examples and also there's some really horrible decapitation photos from Malaya in the decolonization which again just aren't part of the common currency of, of discussing empire um, that some of the photographs that I looked at depicted the the dying uh, wounded uh, enemy soldiers having their bodies looted by uh, war correspondence, for example, and kind of the, the piling up of bodies that we just, it's implied, but we don't really see it. Um, and also, I think this speaks as well to the, 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 the kind of the wider context of the British narrative and where that doesn't fit. And most of these sources are in kind of the National Army Museum, the Imperial War Museum, 
and they're kind of just catalogued somewhere thrown to one side and I'm you know that's not necessarily a, a judgment but th I mean there there is a there is an issue and I think that this needs to be addressed this idea of atrocity photography in a place that's like the National Army Museum is kind of this celebratory idea of, 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 of the empire. So I think it, um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done on that, but I think it's a really good point. Thank you. And then Steve is asking um, Michael about, um, he's saying that you spoke about the West um, India interest and the agricultural interest and just um, wondering if, if there was a kind of connection between um, um, the campaign against the Corn Laws, was there an alliance between the two interests? What was the kind of link there? Um, there actually wasn't. They were on some points uh, inimical to each other right. uh, because the West Indians wanted uh, lower tariffs on certain items, uh, say with, with rum. Uh, whereas the you know the, the agricultural interest uh, they wanted uh, those tariffs higher, which would mean that the alcohol that could be fermented, could be fermented from their crops uh, would be more competitive. Um, but there is you know they, they were you know arguably the two great repeals um, of the 1830s and 40s were the Corn Laws in one hand, uh, and then uh, slavery in the other. Although the sugar duties were also repealed in 1846. Uh, but there is, and I've written about it elsewhere, but there's a whole wealth of information out there about how British political economy and British protectionism was really rooted in defending slavery uh, and in defending the West Indian interests. Thank you. And and just perhaps a um, follow up question to the to the first one that you answered, um, Michael and um, Bernadette saying that in 2015, uh, David Cameron declined reparations, stating that the descendants um, of the enslaved should move on, um, but she's contrasting that with money given to other projects, like prison building and so on. So um, what she's asking, what is now being done to, to try and um, ensure reparations or try and gain reparations? Well, I, I, so, so to, to explain the incident that uh, Bernadette's referring to, um, whenever David Cameron made a visit to Jamaica, he was expected to apologize for slavery. Uh, but instead of doing that, he said, no, it's time to move on together. Uh, and announced that he that the British government would give 25 million pounds to fund the construction of a prison in Jamaica to right. house right. the uh, the descendants of the Windrush generation, whom Theresa May's Home Office was at the time attempting to deport. So this was one of the most diplomatically tone deaf and offensive things I think that any British Prime Minister has done. In terms of what can be done to ensure reparations. I don't know. I think the first place is to force the British government into an apology, but I, I have no idea how that kind of moral or economic or political pressure could be applied. Sadly, I don't think that the Caribbean nations, even collectively, have that kind of weight. Um, so it might well require uh, America taking the lead in making its own uh, reparatory payments or embarking on its own programme of reparatory justice before we, and I say we as, as in the British government, uh, yeah. would follow <laughs> And um, sadly, that's quite a pes pessimistic view. Thank you. Um, and then um, Bass is asking um, Michelle, um, to what extent did the British use local aux auxiliaries or indigenous um, mm -hmm. um, people? Um, you know, how were um, local populations almost like played out, played against each other? And did that shape the warfare? Yeah, thanks so much for raising that, because it's a very important point that, of course, much of what we just refer to as kind of the British army in these contexts are indeed indigenous troops. Divide and rule strategies were very much uh, present. Um, and the reason I kind of focus in the language on the British army is of course, because this is about British objectives, British led kind of British commanders. Uh, but of course, many of those dying and fighting on behalf of the British empire were indigenous. Um, also, in the case of Sudan, for example, they would, of course, take prisoners and then those prisoners would be brought over to the to the British side. So then they would be fighting alongside who was previously their foes. And then, of course, you had the previous foes fighting each other. So um, it was a much more complicated picture on the ground than obviously I've had time to kind of describe to you tonight. <laughs> yes, thank you. And then um, I think just a, a final question um i think there's a couple of questions about um one about um how how memorialization one about um 
whether school curricula should change. So I wonder if you could both just kind of finish off by by commenting in terms of British historical memory, um, you know, just saying what you think about whether um, we need to think more about how we memorialize these events or teach um, these events. So um, if um, we start with Michelle. Uh, absolutely, I think we need to think more about this. Um, and I also think, for example, in the last years, that Michael Gove's idea of asking Neil Ferguson how we should teach the British Empire is indicative and obviously, in my view, the wrong approach of how one goes about that. Um, I think in, in the case of kind of memorialization, um, I mean, scholars in particular have focused on kind of the Imperial War Museum failing to deal with its imperial legacies and not using that in the context of uh, settler colonialism and genocide in Australia, for example. Um, obviously, we now have this, 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 the arguments about the statues and whether they should be pulled down. And certainly, for example, with Kitchener's statue, which was brought over from Khartoum, um, it really doesn't, um, it doesn't articulate anything. We have this list of where he was, what he did, but you know, where's, there's such a, a level still of kind of silent uh, suffering that just isn't, isn't present. So I think maybe plaques to maybe provide some context to this so that people can actually see what's behind the meaning of these kind of memorials. And obviously there are things like, you know, walking tours of, uh, and tours of the British Museum. And obviously museums are also dealing with these issues and being forced to deal with these issues. Um, I think so much needs to be done. I'm not particularly optimistic at the moment with the transition with Brexit and obviously Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg's kind of manifesto history of um, where they see things going is, is, is the climate in which it will happen. But at the same time, obviously the last year we've seen developments in this kind of conscious uh, discussion of these issues. So yeah. Let's hope. <laughs> yes, thank um, you. And then I, Michael, yes. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I guess I'd like to make two points in response to that. The first thing is that um, in terms of the statues, um, taking down a statue does not delete that person from history. These statues are not primary sources. They are posthumous representations of a community that chose to celebrate that person. If we in the 21st century no longer think that person is worth celebrating, I don't think there's any good reason for keeping that statue up. Uh, the second point, and I th it's actually not inter it's not memorialization, but it, it, it's, it's linguistic, and it's an answer to a question that somebody else posed in the chat that I saw. Um, it doesn't dehumanize uh, people to refer to them as slaves rather than as enslaved people, um, and that's a point that I came to quite late, and I think it's a point that historians generally have come to relatively late, uh, because certainly whenever I began my uh, sort of PhD research ten years ago. Uh, historians would refer just as a matter of course to slaves and not to enslaved people. Um, but I think if you put yourself in the position of somebody uh, who might be speaking to an enslaved person, if you say you are a slave and that is your totality, uh, well that's the part of the dehumanization that made enslavement possible in the first place. It's a completely different thing to refer to enslaved people. That does emphasize their humanity and I think if we did that as historians or as you know within public discourse, uh, then we would sort of place the emphasis on that humanity and that would force us really to reckon with what a, you know, an atrocity it was. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and I think we've got another question on, um, or, or a, a comment um, from, from a teacher about introducing these kind of subjects and they are planning to um, at key stage three and at A level, but, it, but, sh but they're commenting that it needs exam board backing. Um, so, um, Yes, just it just remains um, for me to thank um, our speakers once once again. Um, I think it's been a really thought provoking um, conversation. So thank you for all your answers. Thank you all for coming and for all your um, brilliant questions as well. Um, and um, yes, we hope to see you again at future Vena Library events. Um, we're planning future events in this this um, series, and and the the next event might actually focus on um, on German the German. Um, German Empire and the legacies of that but there'll be more details to follow on that soon so thank you all so much I'm really sorry if I didn't get to your question I did sort of try but I was kind of jumping about everywhere um, but thank you all very much and um, good night thank you